All right. This is Alan Brinkley, The Unfinished Nation. We'll be looking at chapter 26, America in a World at War. Um, so let's recall just last chapter. Chapter 25 was all about the outbreak of World War II. And so this chapter is focusing much more on the actual consequences of the war itself. So um, just to kind of bring things back, uh, the event that got the United States involved in, uh, in World War II was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And this happened December 7th, 1941. And after that point, it became more or less impossible for the United States to remain, um, you know, remain uh, neutral or isolated. And as a consequence, uh, it brought the United States also into war or also into conflict with the, um, you know, allies of the Japanese. So let us just kind of map out in terms of who is fighting who on the side of the Axis powers. We have Japan, Nazi Germany, and Italy was the first fascist nation to be established. Uh, and then on the Allies side, our major allies are, of course, uh, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. And those are primarily who is fighting against who. So war on two fronts meant that the United States would have to fight both Japan in what we call the Pacific Theater, Pacific referring to the Pacific Ocean, but also would be required to fight Germany in places like Europe or the European theater. So the United States participates in World War II in kind of two different areas. Um, so first and foremost, um, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, it was also part of a much larger um, attack by Japan to occupy other areas in the Pacific. Namely was the invasion of the U.S. colony, the Philippines. So we might just say about the Philippines, let us recall from an earlier chapter, that this was a U.S. colony attacked and we'll say taken over by Japan. You know, one of the major reasons why Japan attacked the United States Navy at Pearl Harbor was so that they could expand into Asia without facing any sort of opposition or facing much less opposition. And so the Philippines was one of those areas under attack. In the Pacific theater, American forces are going to be led by General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, Douglas MacArthur will say he is, uh, will say, uh, leading U.S. forces in the Pacific. And the Pacific War, and here we can see a photo of MacArthur himself, uh, rather kind of iconic in the way that, um, you know, he had his uh, corn cob pipe that was very much kind of a part of his persona. Um, in the Pacific, mostly it's Americans and the Japanese that are fighting each other, whereas Europe will involve pretty much uh, all the major, um, you know, powers, uh, Germany, Soviet Union, Britain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so even though Pearl Harbor was quite a big setback for the United States, um, the United States turned the tides of war pretty quickly in, uh, in the Pacific. And at the Battle of Midway Island, this was a battle which turned the Pacific War in favor of the Americans. 
It's sometimes been referred to as maybe the most decisive battle in naval history. Um, so it was certainly an American victory. And from that point onwards, um, you know, the Americans were on the attack and the Japanese were on the retreat. So Midway Island being one of those important, um, you know, important battles in the Pacific. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, uh, American forces were put under the command of Dwight D. Eisenhower. So whereas uh, MacArthur is in charge of forces in the Pacific, Eisenhower will say in charge of U.S., and not just U.S., but also U.S. and allied forces in Europe. And some of the first Americans to set foot in the European theater actually did so in Northern Africa rather than Europe itself. So we might say the first uh, combat Americans uh, saw in Europe. And this was because the United States was kind of faced with a somewhat of a dilemma. Um, you know, the United States focused first on kind of uh, making uh, more of their military effort towards Europe rather than Japan, which might be kind of surprising because it was the Japanese that attacked the United States and got them involved in the war. Um, but the Americans really wanted to make sure that they came to the rescue of their allies. They didn't want to see either the British or the Soviets surrender. And so going to help their allies in Europe, the Americans were more or less presented with the dilemma of, well, which ally to help first? Uh, would it be help the British first or help the Soviets first? And ultimately, who the Americans chose to assist first were the British. And a kind of a crucial part of the British Empire was, um, you know, specifically, um, we can't really see it on, on this map here, but if it went a little bit further, it was the Suez Canal. Um, you know, the British had a massive empire that spanned across the globe. And so the idea of securing the Suez Canal for the British would continue, um, you know, their war effort would, would make it more effective. So uh, Americans uh, landed in northern Africa and, you know, began battling the Germans uh, there first before anywhere else. One of the important battles that took place in, you know, the African theater or the European theater early on was El Alamein. This was a British defeat of Germany, and also a turning point. You know, uh, very early on, before the Americans and Soviets had gotten involved, um, you know, the Axis powers, Germany, Japan, and Italy, were having tremendous success on the battlefield. Let's talk a little bit more in, in the last chapter, but the surrender of France, for example, uh, the German occupation of, uh, and you can see it just on this map here, of countries like Yugoslavia, uh, Greece, Northern Africa was taken over by the Germans, Bulgaria, large parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, here we have France, which was successfully taken over by the Axis. Um, and so after the victory at El Alamein, that's when Allied forces began to make progress in Africa, turning uh, the Germans and the Italians back. We also are introduced to a couple of generals. We're just going to go ahead and, and kind of rattle them off by name. Uh, it might be good to be familiar with them. Uh, Erwin Rommel, he was the German general, uh, specifically in Northern Africa, you know, in Europe more broadly. Uh, George Patton, he was a U.S. general in Europe. Maybe besides Dwight Eisenhower, maybe the most recognizable U.S. general in um you know, besides Eisenhower and MacArthur, maybe the most recognized general in, in the United States in World War II, and then Bernard Montgomery, he is a British general. So these were just some of the military leaders uh, that were active in the European theater, Rommel, Patton, and Montgomery, German, uh, American, and, uh, and British. Um, however, though, despite, uh, you know, the fact that Americans were involved in places like, um, you know, Northern Africa, we can also see from this map uh, showing allied forces infiltrating these other areas. We can also see American forces uh, 
making their way into Italy, which in fact was the first place on the European continent that U.S. troops landed. But by far, the majority of the fighting in World War II was actually done between the Russians and the Germans. So we might just take note that the majority... of the fighting, we might even say the fighting and dying uh, in World War II took place between Germany and the Soviet Union, and right? the Soviet Union, which is, uh, which is Russia. Union. And so the most important battle there, and maybe the most important battle of the war, was the Battle of Stalingrad. This was a Soviet victory. German defeat. And once again, it led to a German retreat. So as far as important battles during World War II go, uh, I mean, there's plenty of them to name, but the ones that we're going to mention here are first the Battle of Midway Island. Um, all of these, I should say, are, are battles in which, you know, the Axis powers have been successfully expanding and having success on the battlefield. This is the, the turning points, more or less, for each of the theaters. The Battle of Midway Island, the American victory there put the Japanese on, uh, on retreat. Uh, the Battle of El Alamein, the British victory there, put the Germans on retreat in Africa. And lastly, the Battle of Stalingrad, which put the Germans on retreat in Russia, uh, you know, which uh, for the most part, if we look at the, the casualties, for example, uh, most, uh, a majority of the casualties suffered during the war were on the Eastern Front between the Russians and, um, uh, and the Germans. Um, so the last thing that we're also just going to note here is that, you know, uh, Italy, Invaded by Allied forces, we just might take note that this was the first place actually in Europe, so, you know, in Europe specifically, that U.S. troops uh, saw combat. That is, if we are considering uh, Northern Africa to be a separate continent, the idea behind American troops uh, invading Italy was that Italy was considered the weakest of the Axis powers, um, and so therefore, um, you know, they ought to be targeted, uh, targeted first. Uh, one of the defining uh, characteristics or features of the Second World War is the Holocaust, and the Holocaust we can define, uh, you know, maybe just in terms of like a, a definition. This was the Nazi effort to exterminate. And by exterminate, we mean to systematically murder the European Jewish population. And, you know, anti-Semitism had always been a part of the Nazi agenda. Notions of racial supremacy and inferiority had always been part of the agenda. And for the most part, before the war broke out, there were certainly signs and signals from the Nazi government that Jews were, uh, you know, turning into or, or uh, being made second-class citizens. Um, you know, so things like the Nuremberg Laws, for example, the Nuremberg Laws in 1935 stripped German Jews of their citizenship, segregated them from the rest of the German population. You also had episodes like, doubt that I'm spelling this correctly, but um, Kristallnacht. And Kristallnacht was state-sponsored violence against Jewish businesses, Jewish people, the mass arrest of Jewish populations. But what really accelerated the Holocaust was the beginning of the war. Um, and it was once World War II started, that's when the various concentration camps 
And concentration camps had existed before the war. They were mostly prisons. Um, but when the war started, concentration camps were, um, you know, more, more or less used as labor camps and then later death camps. And that was to construct facilities specifically with the intention of murdering as many people um, as possible. And uh, this occurred under the, you know, against the backdrop of the Second World War, right? Against the backdrop of the Second World War. Uh, so the United States' role, or what role the United States has in this, was, you know, when the Allied nations became more aware of the types of atrocities that were being committed in Europe during the war, you know, there was some, there was there was a moment where it was recognized where the the death and destruction that was occurring was not simply just a byproduct of the war itself, but an intentional uh, kind of entire infrastructure. Um, to facilitate, uh, you know, the genocide of an entire population. Um, so even early on, you know, in the years before the war, Nuremberg Laws were 1935, Kristallnacht was 1937, there were already large numbers of Jews, uh, Jewish people in Germany that were looking for other places to go, uh, trying to get out, seeing the type of discriminatory laws that were passed. Some of them came aboard the ship called the St. Louis. St. Louis was a ship carrying 900 Jewish refugees. And they were denied entry into the U.S. All right, denied entry into the U.S. Um, so the St. Louis has often been cited as, you know, an example of a failing of the United States to recognize uh, an international crisis and the ability for the United States to do good, but yet didn't, right, or refused to do so. Uh, an important thing to note is that the St. Louis incident took place in 1939. So this was not kind of at the peak of... Um, you know, the, the Holocaust and the death camps itself. In hindsight, obviously, it's considered to be a huge moral failing, uh, you know, on the part of the United States. Um, and as the war progressed, you know, the United States was made aware of certain, uh, some of these atrocities. Auschwitz, for example, was the most well-known concentration camp. This was a labor and death camp. And when Americans or when the United States realized the extent of what exactly was going on in terms of the Holocaust, it was a decision made by the United States that the most effective and efficient way of bringing an end to the suffering of millions of people was to prioritize, or we might say the, U the United States would prioritize Prioritize uh, winning the war rather than, for example, then maybe do something like target the death camps. And, you know, your book sort of refers to this decision as, again, kind of one of those controversial decisions that might warrant some criticism uh, you know, of the United States and, uh, and the U.S. government. But for those decision makers at the time, you know, they, they would have said or they would have made the argument that winning the war would have been the most effective or efficient way of, of bringing a conclusion um, to the atrocities that, you know, that occurred. Um, so that was uh, you know, a, a specific feature of the uh, you know the war in the war in Europe and and certainly one of the most darkest moments in maybe all of human history. Um, the United States involvement in World War II though is a little bit unique in the sense that the Americans experience the war a little bit differently than the rest of the world does. Um, whereas the West you know the rest of the world when we think about World War II we can think about atrocities like genocides massacres, uh, forced labor. Uh, this is a war primarily in which civilians are killed. 
And it's a war of occupation. You know, World War II is a war in which enemy armies occupy civilian, uh, you know, cities. And again, are responsible for all sorts of wartime atrocities, you know, from forced or coerced labor, labor to, you know, the literal rape of women, uh, massacre, genocide. But for the United States, though, uh, you know, the United States has a little bit different of an experience, right? It was never occupied by a foreign foreign army. The U.S. was. Uh, it was never, with the exception of Pearl Harbor, never really bombed directly. Um, and so the United States, you know, at least in, in the way that we re remember the war here, we tend to remember it maybe in, in a little bit more of a positive light. You know, there's some reference to World War II being the quote-unquote good war. And one of the experiences, too, is, is also related to the economy. And that is just kind of, you know, to put it frank, World War II ended the Great Depression. So whereas the war meant kind of all these other things to the majority of countries that participated in it, um, for a lot of Americans, the, the war meant economic opportunity, right? Great Depression we have listed right here ended with World War II. Oops. Ended with World War II. Um, and, you know, unemployment went, you know, from, you know, during the Great Depression era, unemployment was anywhere from, you know, 25 to 30 percent. It went pretty much down to zero uh, because the war economy uh, made it necessary. Um, it was the massive government spending and the transformation of a kind of civilian economy into a war economy uh, that provided for this. So just to give you some statistics, in 1939, the federal budget was $9 billion. And this was even with programs uh, during the New Deal. Um, that grew to $100 billion in 1944, 1945, you know, the years uh, ending. And for all of the uh, money that was being spent on the war effort, that meant that more people were needed in order to staff uh, you know, those, um, you know, those jobs. And so much like the First World War, the United States government's going to be very active in terms of regulating the economy. Um, so organizations like the Office Price Administration and also the War Production Board will help organize the economy. And many Americans, or we might just say about both of these things here, say organized, oops. Organize the economy for wartime. Um, Americans would be forced to cut back at home, um, you know, specifically the practice of rationing, very common, right, where Americans were limited to what they could buy. And so we have a situation where, on the one hand, Americans are now going back to work. They're earning a lot of money, uh, but yet the rationing system does not allow them to really spend all of it. And the fact that the economy is producing tanks and airplanes and guns and bullets means that it's not producing the type of consumer, um, you know, the type of consumer goods that people will buy. And so if we look at the economy, uh, what's essentially going to happen is that once the war ends in 1944 and 1945, there's going to be a tremendous booming in spending. Uh, we can also see here a sort of propaganda poster that would convince Americans to conserve resources. This was to conserve gasoline uh, 
encouraging Americans to uh, ride share, don't ride alone. When you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Uh, you're wasting gas if you're not um, you know, carpooling with someone. And so uh, a lot of money and resources went into uh, you know, the economy itself, but there's also a lot going into science and technology. You know, World War II was a much more technologically advanced uh, conflict, you know, especially with things like tanks. You know, we talked a little bit last chapter about the way in which tanks had improved so much that it made uh, trench warfare practically obsolete. Airplanes, too, were, uh, you know, were, were a lot more uh, cutting edge. Um, other types of technology that was, uh, you know, experimented with and utilized during World War II, um, you know, the Germans during the later stages of the war were messing with rocket technology, uh, specifically the V-2 rocket that you see imaged here. Um, Long-range bombers. You know, maybe one of the biggest differences between the way World War I and World War II was conducted was the ability for airplanes to drop bombs over long distances. Um, and also things like code breaking and what would eventually become kind of the earliest computing technology, in fact, um, was conducted in or used in, uh, used in World War II. Uh, of course, the big one, and there's a section a little bit later on in the chapter about this, but is, you know, atomic weapons, also a big part there. Um, so a lot of funding went into science, uh, science and technology. It wasn't just kind of the blue collar production, but also the uh, kind of white collar um, production as well. Um, in terms of the impact on race and ethnicity, uh, what we find is that the war provided, for the most part, uh, an opportunity to break down uh, racial, and we'll also add uh, gender barriers. And again, this is also kind of another reason as to why we here in the United States tend to think of World War II maybe in a little bit more of a positive light because the war was was a catalyst to, you know, really uh, be done with some of the ways in which certain people were discriminated against. Um, you know, ra uh, Hitler's um, ideology surrounding racial supremacy uh, was antithetical to a lot of the reasons that Americans gave that they were fighting. Uh, it really discredited, uh, you know, sort of ideas about eugenics and racial supremacy and inferiority. And, and you know, even those things were relatively strong, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, in the, in the decades earlier. Um, so like the First World War, uh, more job opportunities means that more people have, uh, you know, a chance for economic advancement especially those who had historically been discriminated from those jobs in the past. Um, one good example of this is A. Philip Randolph and the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters. The Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, this is primarily an African-American uh, workers' union. And A. Philip Randolph was the leader of or just say the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters. And uh, you see Randolph pictured right here. And during the war, uh, you know, jobs that had attempted to discriminate against African Americans, those that were receiving money from the federal government, um, Randolph and, uh, you know, the, the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters, you know, they actually threatened to march on Washington. You know, there's a much more famous march on Washington that comes about 20 years later. Uh, but Randolph was the first one to, you know, organize a, a protest, uh, you know, threatening to march on Washington. And this was done primarily because those jobs that were related to the war um, were discriminating. They weren't hiring African-American workers. And so eventually what this forced, it actually forced FDR would really be forced to end discrimination 
in the war industries. And, you know, really much like every conflict since the Civil War, African Americans also participated in World War II. Maybe the most famous were the Tuskegee Airmen who carried out piloting missions and air raids in places like Italy in the European conflict. Um, and uh, kind of given what the war meant and what was being fought for, um, World War II would end up being the last racially segregated, um, last racially segregated war in regards to the U.S. military. So uh, during World War II, black and white soldiers didn't fight in the same unit. They fought in separate units, but this war would be the last one that that, um, that, that occurred. Uh, somewhat similarly, uh, Native Americans also provided important contributions to the war. Maybe the most famous example were the Navajo Code Talkers. The Code Talkers were specifically Native Americans who assisted the U.S. war effort. by sending communications in Native American languages. And the reason why this was so valuable was because, uh, you know, in a time period of code breaking and trying to intercept each other's messaging, um, you know, these Native American languages were very hard to, um, you know, to translate for, you know, the Japanese, for the Germans who were keen on trying to figure out what the Americans were doing, in ter in ter uh, you know, in, in terms of their strategy. Um, and so it was a pretty unique contribution to the overall American war effort. Um, additionally, too, the war provided an opportunity for lots of uh, Mexican-American workers um, you know, we have to remember that during the Great Depression, immigration patterns were such that, you know, people were actually leaving the country because of the lack of jobs. Um, once the war started, then there was a lot more opportunities, specifically in places like the West and specifically in relation to, uh, you know, industries like agriculture. And so the United States and Mexico even worked out, um, you know, a program or a deal with each other, the Bracerio program, as it was known. And this was a uh, program that would bring, or maybe we should say brought, contractual, so under contract, uh, Mexican workers uh, into the United States. And Many of them ended up staying in the U.S. and, you know, bought homes, um, married, had children, and, you know, became acclimated into American society, um, ended up staying for a very long time. Now, much like, um, you know, the types of migrations that occurred in northern cities and the tendency for those to lead to racial conflict, the influx of Mexican workers into the United States also uh, fed into racial tensions. One of the more famous examples was the Zoot Suit Riots that happened during World War II. Uh, these were riots in LA between primarily Anglo, and by Anglo, we mean uh, English-speaking Protestants. Uh, Anglo, we'll say sailors, because they're actually members of the Navy, and typically Mexican youth, mostly young men. And during the Zoot Suit Riots, which are named after this kind of uh, suit that you see here, it's kind of a big, long, baggy suit. Uh, the reason why these Mexican teens were targeted, um, beat up, uh, their clothes or suits torn off, 
um, was that, uh, you know, the accusation against them was that they were not saving uh, cloth for the war effort by wearing these kind of very baggy suits, and it was seen as um, them not being very patriotic, but a lot of it too was also fueled by the type of ethnic and racial, uh, you know, tension and xenophobia that, um, you know, existed in places like Los Angeles due to the changing demographic uh, demographic patterns. Um, in terms of uh, at home, though, uh, in the United States, what we find is that World War II is a conflict that is not completely free of ethnic tensions or violence. Uh, the Zoot Suit riots are, are evidence to that. Um, but it's one in which Americans were a lot more united um, in terms of their support for the war effort, um, especially given the, the fact that it was Japan who had launched the surprise attack. And there was really no question as to whether or not the, the U.S. was justified. Now, with that being said, uh, there was also much less of a tendency for Americans to, um, there wasn't as much of a need for Americans to give up on certain civil liberties. Uh, much like we saw in the First World War, uh, with the Sedition Act, for example. Um, but the types of civil liberties that were denied were much more targeted. And the clearest example of this is what happened to Japanese Americans on the West Coast of the United States during the war um, and the internment of them. So when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, the president, FDR, issued an order, um, executive order, Say executive order 9066. And what 9066 did was that it turned the entire West Coast of the United States essentially into a battleground and suspended typical civilian law and placed it in the hands of more or less a military general. And it was under these orders that everybody of Japanese ancestry were required to abandon their homes, abandon their, their workplaces and their businesses, and be moved to relocation centers, right? In essence, concentration camps. And the justification was that this was being done for their own protection, but the way in which these prisons were built, and they more or less were prisons, was to make sure that nobody of Japanese ancestry was willing or able to sabotage uh, the war effort. Uh, they were much less being watched after or protected and more like being uh, controlled or imprisoned. Um, in total, 100,000 people of Japanese ancestry were forced uh, into the camps. Some of the camps themselves were not very well built. You can see a cafeteria here, and maybe get a sense for kind of the overcrowdedness. Some of the camps weren't even built at all, and those who were required to move there actually uh, had to build, it, build them themselves. Um, and uh, what was maybe, um, I mean, of, of all the things that were you know, most distinct about uh, Japanese internment, one of the kind of the glaring things was that um, this was all happening where nobody was given any sort of trial, right? There was never any trial to determine whether or not somebody was guilty of being either sympathetic to the Japanese war effort or not. And so all these people were essentially imprisoned with no trial, which is a violation of the Sixth Amendment. So again, when we think about the encroachment upon civil rights during the Second World War, it's much more targeted. Um, there were other instances where Italians and Germans were accused of, um, you know, uh, siding with the enemy or saying things that were too uh, closely associated associated with the enemy. But in those cases, they were given trials. Here, there, you know, people were just mass arrested because they were Japanese, even if they were American citizens. Now, one individual, Fred Korematsu of Oakland, California actually sued, right? Said this was a violation of the Bill of Rights that just because he was of Japanese ancestry didn't mean that he was forced to go on these, uh, these relocation centers. But in 1944, the US Supreme Court 
upheld um, internment. And the reason was because it was a war going on. That when a war was going on and national security was threatened, then measures like interning everybody of Japanese ancestry was constitutional. With that being said, in 1980, Congress did uh, admit that that was wrong and compensated uh, those who were interned, you know, those still alive. So there was a recognition that this was not uh, the right thing to do, but this came much, much later, right? Didn't happen until the... Um, and happened into the 19, uh, 1980s. Um, so even though, um, you know, World War II was a war in which, you know, Americans were probably more united than maybe any other conflict in this nation's history, we also do have to take into consideration the way in which, um, you know, things like race and ethnicity uh, played out uh, in the United States because it wasn't all, um, you know, it wasn't all uniform. Um, in terms of wartime culture, um, again, we had mentioned before, and this is kind of reiterating something we mentioned earlier, was that um, Americans were now making uh, a lot more money. Um, consumerism, we might say, would boom, would take off, quote unquote, take off after the war was over after the war ended. You know, when those factories would go from making tanks and airplanes to making, uh, what do these things look like? Electric mixers uh, and vacuum cleaners and TVs and automobiles. People had been working, um, you know, all during the war years, couldn't buy anything because of rationing, couldn't buy anything because uh, there are no consumer goods. Um, it would be an explosion of, of consumption and, and really, you know, lead to a very much... Um, uh, prosperous time period. Now, there was a certain element that um, uh, certain information regarding the war was created, but let us remember that in World War II, uh, Americans didn't need as much convincing to um, contribute uh, to the war effort. But an Office of War Information did exist, right? And this was primarily responsible to create propaganda. Um, your textbook also mentions the way in which specifically anti-Japanese propaganda was created and the way in which race, uh, you know, played, played into that. And so we can see uh, some of the ways in which propaganda um, maybe inflamed uh, racial tensions between the Japanese uh, and the United States during the war and then uh, consequences afterwards. Um, for women, though, the war was one of these major catalysts to break down, um, you know, the types of restrictions that gender had typically placed on women in the United States, maybe more so than anywhere else was the workforce. And by far, World War II provided women the opportunity to uh, occupy male-dominated jobs. Again, the misconception is that women didn't work before World War II. That's not necessarily accurate. Let us also re recall, though, that we're going from the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, some of the people that were the first to be laid off were specifically married women. And so those who saw maybe the largest gain in employment amongst all the demographic groups, racial or otherwise, would have been married women across the board. Um, this trend of taking up um, kind of, uh, male positions or traditionally male uh, positions is maybe best symbolized by Rosie the Riveter, who you see uh, imaged here maybe the most iconic symbol from World War II. So Rosie the Riveter symbolized the erosion of male 
dominated industries. You also see it uh, kind of in this propaganda poster here as well, right? A woman wearing a welder's uh, hat and, you know, same type of uniform that Rosie the Riveter uh, is, is wearing there. And of course, along with that came a, uh, a, return, to, uh, a re return to prosperity. Um, so just uh, to, to kind of give us some statistics, in terms of employment, employment for women grew by 60% during the war years. Um, also, the, um, the return to prosperity also had an impact on family life. Again, if we just recall during the Great Depression, because people were not making a lot of money, uh, they were very hesitant to start families, um, but especially after the war was over, um, or at least during the war, we'll just say that um, you know, things like, uh, or, or general patterns that we see uh, across is that you know, marriage rate increases, Marriage age decreases. People were now getting married at a much younger age. Uh, the number of children, especially after the war, would go up right, quite significantly. And this would be the beginning of what we call the baby boom. Now, let's recall that, again, kind of the war is still uh, kind of looming in the background. But certainly the war's end will you know, just accelerate these patterns even more. So uh, more money, more prosperity meant that people were willing to get married uh, more often, get married at younger ages, start to have children more often, and it created some sort of economic stability in regards to, uh, in regards to the family. Now, as the war progressed, um, you know, in the early years, it was especially worrying time, but as the Allies uh, went on the offensive, after the three turning point battles, um, Roosevelt decided that he would run for re-election again. Uh, Roosevelt became the only president to win, or we should say won, a fourth term in office. In 1944. However, though, in 1945, Roosevelt passed away. So he did get the fourth term. He did run for president in 1944, and he did win that election. Um, but he died very shortly afterwards. And that brought Harry Truman, who was appointed to be VP in 1944. So he is the vice president. Now, after Roosevelt's death, turned president. And he will be president for the ending of the war, Harry Truman. The war. Ending of the war. Um, so by 1940, you know, 42, 43, things were looking really good for the Allied war effort. 1944, 1945 would only accelerate those things. Uh, and the Axis powers would eventually be uh, completely and um, uh, totally defeated. Um, in Europe, um, Germany was facing, uh, after the D-Day invasion, a two-front war. If we take a look at this map here, uh, it might not be entirely clear, but we can see here is the Battle of Stalingrad. Um, essentially, the Germans had made progress this far into Russia before being defeated. And in the successive years, it was now time for the Russians to be on the attack. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the British and the Americans were carrying out bombing missions of Germany, uh, including cities like Dresden. Dresden is a German city uh, where Approximately 135,000 civilians were killed. And this kind of brings up an important point about World War II more broadly. Uh, broadly speaking, World War II is a war in which civilians are killed more than, uh, you know, combat deaths. And this is pretty much true for every single uh, country that participates in the war, except for the United States, which has a slightly different experience. 
Um, it's also an important point because for most of the years, you know, those nations that had been experiencing occupation, experiencing brutality, um, experiencing civilians' bombings, um, the tables get turned. And by the end of the war, it's now German civilians that are being bombed. It's Americans occupying Germany. It's Japanese civilians. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the experience of the, the Soviets and the Germans and the Japanese and the French are all kind of very similar in this respect, uh, less so for the Americans. Um, but the tide against Germany really turned after the D-Day invasion. Uh, the D-Day invasion is the largest amphibious, and by amphibious, um, we mean uh, an attack going from water onto land, largest amphibious assault in world history. Allied forces landed at Normandy, which is northern France, which was occupied by the Germans. Northern France, this is the location where U.S., British, and Canadian uh, troops landed. here on the map, uh, here's where the D-Day invasion took place, right? So Allied forces, Americans, British, and Canadians all landed there. And then at that point, Germany was faced with, uh, you know, a very kind of dire situation in which the Russians were coming from one side and the Americans, the British, and the French were coming, uh, coming on the other. Uh, and it wouldn't be long before, uh, you know, Germany was, was forced to surrender. Uh, Paris was liberated in 1944. It had been controlled by Germany since 1940 for four years. The Battle of the Bulge, this was the last German attack. On Allied forces. It failed. And not long afterwards, on April 30th, Hitler would commit suicide. And this would be by 1945. By May 8th, very, very shortly afterward, Germany would surrender. Germany would surrender. Um, and that brought an end to the war in Europe. Um, sometimes May 8th is referred to as VE Day or Victory in Europe. So that brought a conclusion to the war, um, to the war in Europe. For the United States, though, there was still an entire other theater uh, in which the war was to be fought, and that was in the Pacific Theater, which was a little bit different in the way that the war was conducted, uh, rather than a Kind of comprehensive land war. This was much more of a naval war uh, going from island to island to island to island. Um, we can see here on the map a little bit, although it is kind of small, that after the Battle of Midway here, Americans were on the offensive and they began attacking Japanese occupied islands all along the way, eventually trying to make their way close enough to the Japanese mainland so that they could begin carrying out bombing missions against Japan. And that was the idea um, because of um, that was where the Japanese war effort was being produced. In fact, uh, a strategy called island hopping is typically used to describe the US, uh, the US strategy here. But what Americans found in, um, you know, in these battles was that there were very, very high casualties, and the battles themselves were very tough, and the Japanese did not really show a willingness um, to surrender. Um, two of the maybe tougher battles included Iwo Jima and Okinawa, right? So these were two battles 
between the U.S. and Japan with very high uh, death rates, right? Uh, not just in terms of the Japanese military, but also um, Japanese civilians. In Okinawa alone, about 100,000 Japanese died. And the willingness of the Japanese to use Tactics such as kamikaze or kamikaze attacks. These were attacks where uh, Japanese pilots pilots. Not really spelled with an e. No, no. Where Japanese pilots uh, would quote unquote suicide crash into American ships. And especially during the later years of the war when Japan was very desperate, there were about 3,500 of such attacks. And so um, the reason why Okinawa and Iwo Jima are important because, you know, the high death rate, the way in which they were hard fought, the perception that Japan was not willing to surrender and instead fight to the death, um, that played a lot into the decision of the U United States to end the war uh, the way in which it did, um, and that was to use atomic weapons. Now, atomic warfare was one of those newer technologies that was being developed during the war. In fact, atomic warfare, there was somewhat of a race between Germany and the US to develop atomic weapons. Atomic weapons. Um, Albert Einstein and his theories regarding physics, he's typically credited with a lot of the important modern understandings about what goes into harnessing atomic energy. Um, he contributed to the development of the atomic bombs, we might say contributed to developing the atomic bomb. And he had actually been a refugee from Germany. He had gone from Germany to the United States and had brought a lot of that value, uh, valuable information uh, with him. And so Roosevelt had hired the best scientists in the world, and they worked on what was known as the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project, this was the secret project, secret project to develop an atomic weapon. So during the war, there was a question who would develop it first, right? Would it be Germany or would it be the United States? Ultimately, it was the United States that was to develop it, but this happened uh, not before Roosevelt died. And so when Roosevelt died, let us recall that now the decision maker was Harry Truman, who we see here. And in fact, it would be Harry Truman who would ultimately make the decision or who would be required to make the decision about using atomic weapons. And your textbook goes into more details about the controversies surrounding it, because certainly since the use of atomic weapons against Japan, there has been a lot more controversy around it. One, because it's the only time that atomic weapons have been used. You know, if they had become more commonplace, then there may be less of a controversy here. Um, but, you know, kind of the big question was, was it justified? Was it justified? 
And from the perspective of Truman and the United States, the experience of Okinawa and Iwo Jima led them to speculate that, you know, a traditional invasion of Japan might cost millions upon millions of American lives and then countless millions uh, of Japanese lives. And so Truman made the decision to use the newly developed atomic weapons. It was first used on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Uh, this was August 8th. It was dropped. And approximately 80,000 people were killed as a result of that. Um, sorry, August 6th was the first one. August 6th was the first one. And then the second one was dropped on the Japanese city of uh, Nagasaki. This happened August 8th, just two days afterwards. Approximately 100,000 people dead resulting from that. And it was at that point, because of the massive destruction brought about by the atomic weapons, uh, the way in which Hiroshima and Nagasaki were completely destroyed, that Japan finally surrendered. 